Henry David Thoreau thought there was more to life if we could slow down and learn to do with less. I went to these woods because I wished to live deliberately, to confront only the essential facts of life, to see if I could learn what it had to teach and not when I came to die discover that I had not lived. I wished to live deep and suck out all the marrow of life. Here was somebody who really shared my uh, intuitive understanding of what uh, the forests were. It wasn't just a, a source of uh, cheap lumber. It was something real, something alive, something that, uh, that had dignity. I think Walden is one of the greatest books to come out of the 19th century and maybe to come out of the American literary tradition. It's become a part of the American imagination even for those who haven't read it. of July, 1845. Thoreau put the busy, competitive world behind him and made his personal declaration of independence. He began a solitary life beside Walden Pond near Concord, Massachusetts. He lived here for just over two years, during which time he kept a journal, raw material for the book. On the surface, it is a simple accounting of what he did and saw and thought commonplace, everyday things. But his writing transformed them, gave them far grander significance. On its deeper level, Walden is a spiritual journey in search of the self, and a call for people to step out of the rat race occasionally and follow, to sweep away the clutter of things which complicate our lives. Our life is frittered away by detail. An honest man has hardly need to count more than his ten fingers, or in extreme cases, he may add his ten toes and lump the rest. Simplicity, simplicity, simplicity. The book has 17 chapters with simple headings using only 39 words, a paragon of brevity. It also is a book written with passion, eloquence, and wit. One critic found Walden of particular relevance to young people who, like Thoreau when he entered the woods, have yet to establish their independence, who still are trying to find themselves and their place in the world. Many today are familiar with lines and phrases by Thoreau without any idea who wrote them. The mass of men lead lives of quiet desperation. If a man does not keep pace with his companions, perhaps it is because he hears a different drummer. A man is rich in proportion to the things he can afford to let alone. Much of the Western world was in the throes of the Industrial Revolution. In Europe and America, workers were beginning to rebel against the cruelties and excesses of that revolution. Riots and revolutions exploded across Europe from Paris to Vienna. Marx and Engels published their Communist Manifesto. Industrialization forced many to live in crowded urban hovels. Industrial organization turned individuals into numbers. Mass production was producing a new materialism everywhere. 
This period was the forge in which the prime issues and conflicts of the 20th century were shaped. In America, the women's movement was gathering momentum, and North and South were held bent for cataclysm. It, it's a, a very exciting and very emotionally exciting time. It's the 15 years before the Civil War. And while that sounds like a long time, the anti-slavery movement is drumming, drumming, drumming. And the, the whole feel of trouble is, is in the air. Concord was an anti-slavery hotbed. Many of its leading citizens were active in or supported the abolitionist movement. That included a group of writers who constituted an entire wing of American literature. Ralph Waldo Emerson, Bronson Alcott, Louisa May Alcott, Nathaniel Hawthorne, and Henry David Thoreau. All these famous American authors were neighbors and friends in Concord. They met together in one another's homes. They discussed, they wrote, and several promoted the abolitionist cause. These were the transcendentalists. Essentially, the transcendentalists were mystics. They believed that uh, the individual can have a direct relationship with God, can experience God directly. In fact, the transcendentalists believe that there's one great universal world soul, Emerson calls it the oversoul, that pervades all of creation. Thoreau believed the connection with that oversoul was through nature. He was convinced he could find God there. My profession is to be always on the alert to find God in nature, to know his lurking places, to attend all the oratorios, the operas in nature. He also thought he could find the truth in nature and live his life according to principles. Thoreau said that the world rests on principles and he did not believe that we can compromise these higher principles and pursuits, that they are the highest reality, in fact. Tom Blanding may look like Ben Franklin lost in time. In fact, he is a Concord resident who has made himself an expert on the philosopher with a collection of file cards covering every day of Thoreau's life. I suppose I'm something over 10,000 cards now. Uh, I don't keep a count, but uh, judging by how many shoe boxes they fill, uh, I suppose I'm up to about that. Well, welcome to you all. He also conducts classes for all tourists. You know, Blanding is highly regarded for his detailed knowledge, not only of Thoreau, but of transcendentalism and its advocates in general. Okay, thanks. Um, when... Um, the distinguished Mrs. Barlow of Boston was asked what transcendentalism meant. She said with a wave of her hand, transcendentalism means a little beyond. But I think, in fact, most of Boston considered it farther out than that. Uh, it began as a movement within the Unitarian Church here in some, some of the, East, the churches in eastern Massachusetts as a reform impulse against the rather dry, rational approach to religion that uh, the church was taking at that time. It is to the transcendentalists that Concord owes its reputation as the home of what literary history calls the American Renaissance. Of course, the town already had a special place in American history. When Paul Revere cried, the British are coming. This is where they came. And this is the bridge where they were stopped. Six decades later, a poem by Emerson would commemorate the Minutemen at North Bridge and conclude with a line once familiar to every American school child. Here the embattled farmer stood and fired the shot heard round the world. Of perception. I think the reason that people can't but both Emerson and Thoreau thought America had slipped badly since the time of its birth. Thoreau thought the country had lost its way or its soul, 
and he felt very strongly about such moral issues as slavery and imperialism. Our souls are encased in these bodies, but it's not... Emerson was both friend and mentor to the younger Thoreau, though the two were very different. Thoreau was a strong individualist who resisted making life's daily concessions. Emerson was the gentle patrician. It was Emerson's land on which Thoreau built his cabin in the woods and settled down to try his own experiment in simple living. I lived alone in the woods a mile from any people in a house which I built myself on the shore of Walden Pond in Concord, Massachusetts and earned my living by the labor of my hands. I lived there two years and two months. I have thus a tight shingled and plastered house, 10 feet wide by 15 feet long and eight foot posts, with a garret and a closet, a large window on each side, two trap doors, one door at the end, and a brick fireplace opposite. The exact cost of my house, $28, 12 and one half cents. And he stayed to record the cycling of the seasons. The book wheels marvelously through the seasons. He compressed his two years, two months, and two days at Walden Pond in actuality into one seasonal cycle. And he begins in the spring goes through the summer, goes through the autumn, goes through the winter in the frozen ponds. And at the end of winter, the ponds begin to break up, the ice begins to crack, the voice of the pond emerges, and then you come into spring. People picture Thoreau as the Walden hermit, secluded, doing everything for himself. Not entirely true. We always used to wear these buttons that said, uh, Thoreau went home on weekends. And uh, which it's, it's certain that he did. Uh, and he went home, for example, for six weeks while the plaster was drying out in the cabin. Uh, I mean, he went in and out of it. This was not a hermitage. What Walden symbolizes is a balance between civilization and nature. Uh, Thoreau didn't move to a pr primitive landscape uh, when he moved to Walden. It was only a mile and a half from the village. He had uh, society at his elbow. But he said in Walden, we need the tonic of wildness. He hosted the anti-slavery society picnic, and he had friends out there. Uh, friends who passed through, pa friends who spent time, he had the animals, but it was essentially him. And that was really the point, because his idea of reform is that you reform, you don't reform communities, you don't reform crowds, you reform people one at a time and you reform yourself. And that's really where it begins. It's what the book means, I, uh, if Walden means anything. Self-reform acquired independence from society and the values of expediency. But Thoreau was not disconnected from the larger world. He was kept up to date by friends like the poet Ellery Channing. He supported the local Underground Railroad, which hid runaway slaves. His opposition to slavery even got him thrown into jail for a few hours. Thoreau went to jail for refusing to pay his poll tax, the voting tax. It was a matter of conscience for Thoreau. It was a symbolic protest against the U.S. government that was waging the Mexican War. He felt to extend slave territory, and Thoreau would not cooperate in any way with the evil institution of slavery. I cannot for an instant recognize that political organization as my government, which is the slave's government also. Emerson visited Thoreau in jail and, according to legend, asked Henry, what are you doing in here? To which Thoreau allegedly answered, what are you doing out there? The story is doubted by many. But it is apocryphal. If it didn't happen, it should have. Actually, Emerson ridiculed his young friend's self-inflicted martyrdom. And with some reason. 
The amount of tax involved was $1.50, and unbeknownst to Henry, his aunt paid his tax for him. And he spent the night in jail simply because the sheriff and tax collector, one Sam Staples, had left for the day and didn't want to be bothered going back. And it wasn't even an original gesture. His neighbor, Bronson Alcott, had set the example three years earlier. So why do we still celebrate the night in jail? Again, say the experts, it is the transforming power of his writing. One critic wrote that, as a political warrior, Thoreau was a comic little figure. As a political writer, he was the most ringing and magnificent polemicist America has ever produced. Indeed, the product of this episode was a major work of American literature and political philosophy, civil disobedience. It would become the blueprint for two great non-violent protest movements of the 20th century. Mohandas Gandhi's liberation of India and Martin Luther King's civil rights crusade in the United States. Both leaders claimed Thoreau as a major influence. King was fascinated with the idea of refusing to cooperate with an unjust government as he considered the boycotts he would lead in Montgomery, Alabama. Of civil disobedience, he wrote, I remember how, as a college student, I had been moved when I first read this work. I became convinced that what we were preparing to do in Montgomery was related to what Thoreau had expressed. We were simply saying to the white community, we can no longer lend our cooperation to an evil system. Of course, for King, Thoreau's idea of non-cooperation cost a lot more than a dollar fifty and a night in jail. essay, by the way, did not discuss the issue of violence versus nonviolence. He may have preferred nonviolence, but the question wasn't posed, and that left an ambiguity that remains. For in a speech in 1859, Thoreau passionately defended the militant abolitionist John Brown, who practiced violence at a place called Harper's Ferry, and was about to be hanged for it. It was his peculiar doctrine that a man has a perfect right to interfere by force with the slaveholder in order to rescue the slave. The same indignation that is said to have cleared the temple once will clear it again. The question is not about the weapon, but the spirit in which you use it. No man has appeared in America as yet who loved his fellow man so well he is not old brown any longer. He is an angel of lights. Calling John Brown an angel of light clearly endorsed violence in the right cause. Thoreau seems to have shifted towards violence as the Civil War approached. But the violence, non-violence ambiguity persists today. You might call Paul Watson a modern John Brown for 18 years, Watson has been head of the Sea Shepherd Society, the world's most active marine environmental organization. He's also captain of the society's vessel, the Sea Shepherd. Watson calls himself a non-violent ecological warrior whose mission it is to attack sealing, whaling, and drift net operations worldwide. One ship will set a net that is from 40 to 60 miles in length. And uh, each net 26 feet deep. It's like putting a curtain of death across the ocean. It's like strip mining the oceans. And anything that comes in contact with these invisible nets uh, is entangled in them and drowned.
In 1987, we uh, began our campaign to directly intervene against uh, drift netters, and we found them, we rammed them uh, to destroy their power blocks and confiscate and destroy their nets. We cost them millions of dollars worth of damage. I always look upon my role as a conservationist as uh, I'm there to say things that people don't want to hear and do things that people don't want to see being done. Uh, we're there to rock the boat. I mean, in fact, sink the boat, literally. Watson's operation hasn't killed anyone yet, but his nonviolent status seems a little shaky as well as vulnerable to chance. What would Thoreau think of it? I really can't speak for whether he would applaud me, but from reading what he's written, I think that he would be very supportive of, uh, of what we're doing. The question is not about the weapon, but the spirit in which you use it. Sometimes you need good pirates to take on bad pirates, and we tend to look upon ourselves, of course, as being the, the good pirates. Sometime after this interview, Watson was caught by the Norwegians and thrown in jail. Thoreau would have understood. It is not desirable to cultivate a respect for law so much as for the right. Someone has said Thoreau was always torn by two powerful desires to enjoy the world, and to set the world straight. Henry David Thoreau was a contemporary of Abraham Lincoln, but he wasn't born in a log cabin, never split rails, never knew serious danger or genuine hardship. He was born, in fact, in Concord the son of educated, middle-class parents who lived in the lap of civilization. Thoreau came from quite a remarkable family. They, they were active abolitionists. They, they were um, a very well-read people. Uh, they, his mother ran a boarding house. His father was in the pencil business. And Mrs. Thoreau had a very strong personality. She could be very outspoken, very plain-spoken, also a very feeling and compassionate person with a very strong will. Sometimes too strong for Henry. Cynthia Thoreau, for instance, disliked Ellery Channing and made that very clear. Henry's father, John Thoreau, owned a successful pencil business and did well enough to send Henry to Harvard, only 13 miles away. After college, Thoreau came back to Concord and got a teaching job and quickly got into the kind of trouble that seemed to be in character for him. He refused to flog his students and this became an issue over which he resigned, leading to his not having uh, any work to do. It just comes and it goes and it's warm and it's hot and it's all things in between. Thoreau did help his father in the pencil business but that didn't satisfy. He needed something else. And uh, he established a private school with his brother John. And uh, this, for a time, gave him a chance to also work on his writing. It was also a time, perhaps, to consider marriage. But that was not to be. He never married, never really had a girlfriend. He did propose marriage once. Both he and John fell for a young lady named Ellen Sewell. John proposed to her first and was turned down. Henry decided he would try his hand and got the same treatment. The girl's father, a conservative Unitarian minister, seems to have been behind the rejection. He didn't like the more radical transcendentalists. At another point, Henry, who made a second home at Emerson's house, was thought by some to have been attracted to Emerson's wife, Lydian. Very sweet. That's right. I had forgotten just... Well, so nothing ever came of it. He was so upset about that. He apparently remained celibate throughout his life. Of course, today, celibacy outside the priesthood raises eyebrows, and some suggest homosexual leanings. I'll have to finish tomorrow. I'd like that. 
But what he unarguably did have was a quite rarefied view of sex. Hillary Channing liked to tell dirty jokes. Thoreau despised them. Whatever may befall me, I trust that I may never lose my respect for purity in others. The subject of sex is one on which I do not wish to meet a man at all, unless I can meet him on the most inspiring ground. I would preserve purity in act and thought as I would cherish the memory of my mother. Not long after Henry and his brother established their school came what the experts agree was the critical event in Thoreau's adult life. John cut himself while shaving and developed lockjaw. A few days later, his jaw clamped shut and he couldn't get any food down. They sent for specialists from Boston who came out. There was nothing they could do. They said he's going to die. Ten days later, John died in Henry's arms. This affected Thoreau so deeply that shortly after John died, he came down himself with a sympathetic lockjaw. One might wonder if the move to Walden didn't have an element of escape. I want to go soon and live away by the pond where I shall hear only the wind whispering among the reeds. I will be a success if I have left myself behind. But my friends ask what I will do when I get there. Will it not be employment enough to watch the progress of the seasons? Not for most people. But clearly, Thoreau is a special case. The same can be said for his independence. Henry David Thoreau, the philosopher of independence, never pulled up stakes and moved elsewhere, never left his mother, never left home. There was and is a double-edged quality to Thoreau which confuses and irritates some people. I've always thought that I was lucky to be dealing with what he wrote uh, and not with him as a person, because I think he probably would have been real difficult to deal with. Nor was Thoreau well liked by all of his peers. He was skewered by some fellow writers. James Russell Lowell, who claimed Henry had an unhealthy mind said Thoreau's whole life was a search for the doctor. And Oliver Wendell Holmes, who deplored Thoreau's total lack of taste for the finer forms of cuisine, said he was a man who insisted on nibbling his asparagus at the wrong end. I love good food, and I think that's probably, I think Thoreau would look disapprovingly at the kinds of restaurants I, I visit when I have the opportunity. He was asked what dish he liked, best and he said the one nearest him so he was not uh, he felt food just kept body and soul together a young Thoreau once said God does not sympathize with the common movements he would later say I came into this world not to make it a good place but to live in it good or bad and some fine smugness even arrogance in those lines and sometimes the opposing forces in Thoreau appeared to produce outright contradiction. In Civil Disobedience, he wrote that no one had a duty to eradicate evil only to keep one's hands clean of it. And three paragraphs later, he wrote of the need to right wrongs, action from principle. Sometimes Thoreau could be a veritable human question mark. Thoreau doesn't give you very many answers. He raises lots of questions. I think that may be another reason people are not always happy with him. It might be asked what kind of Democrat would write the line, any man more right than his neighbors constitutes a majority of one. And that question seems to answer itself. Thoreau was at heart no Democrat. Plato, who preferred rule by philosopher Kings, would have understood. Finally, some feel Thoreau's sojourn in solitude, his harping on himself, reveals a basic selfishness. It is self-regarding in a way, but it's self-regarding because Thoreau thinks that your starting place for reform is yourself, and that it's a little hypocritical simply to start with the reform of other people. 
Mark Twain has some caustic things to say about that, too. He says, nothing so needs reforming so much as other people's habits. So who is the real Henry David Thoreau? I don't think there's any way we can know the real person anymore. Um, the real person's gone. I th and I don't think any one person who was a friend of Thoreau's knew the whole real person. What we have is what he wrote. rediscovered Walden Pond in the 20th century. Railroad tracks already ran past it in Thoreau's time, and before the century was out, the train was bringing people to Walden in droves. It continued through the years to be a popular haven, a must-see on the itinerary of any Concorde tour. As such, it took on recreational attractions and conveniences that began to change its nature. In the 1960s, the hippies took on Thoreau as their hero. And swimmers flocked to the water, which produced a terrible indignity. Walden Pond was found to have the highest urine content of any body of water in Massachusetts. The developers came with their bulldozers scraping away trees for a new beach, and preparing to flatten the woods around the pond to make room for condominiums. Thorough had a line for it. If some are prosecuted for abusing children, others deserve to be prosecuted for maltreating the face of nature committed to their care. A small group of local citizens became alarmed at this point and mounted a defense of Henry's pond. I've just been looking at a few of our... You know, there's no author that's more associated with a place than, uh, than Thoreau. And, and Walden Pond is such a symbol, and, and that was the real power that we finally realized that we could draw on, was that symbolic power of the pond and the book Walden. And yet it was amazing how, uh, in talking to people in the press, I couldn't really ignite them as quickly as I thought. The amazing thing was, too, that people outside of Concord got this yeah. right away. I would talk to my relatives and other places. They'd go, I thought Walden was protected, mm -hmm. number one. And number two, I can't believe it. What are you talking about? They want to build condos and they want to build an office park in Walden Woods? Isn't that, isn't, aren't people doing something about it? And I said, well, a few people are trying to do something about it, and we need your help. <laughs> <laughs> that was when it began to turn around the Walden Woods project, raised millions of dollars and purchased much of the land surrounding the pond, protecting it from further development. The newly formed Thoreau Institute is preserving Thoreau's writings. They will house in this building the most comprehensive collection of his work. One purpose of this center is to provide environmental education both on-site and as a resource to classrooms everywhere via the World Wide Web. Electronic Walden? Is Henry David spinning in his grave? One thing you have to, to realize about Thoreau when you talk about technology is that Thoreau was as technologically sophisticated as you probably could be in his time. Thoreau was basically an engineer. Uh, he worked in the family pencil business. He uh, built a machine that ground the lead more finely than it had been ground before. He found uh, a formula for combining the lead with clay so that it would make a, a good smooth line, so that his pencil, the family pencil, would make a good smooth line. And the family pencils won awards. He, he went around and measured. Thoreau made his living uh, along with helping manage the family business as a surveyor. He would have been unhappy, I think, as he was in his own day, about how we see material progress as a panacea to all of our ills. He's not anti-technology at all. Some have said, well, if Thor wouldn't have wanted to use computers, he wouldn't have wanted to use cameras. He would have been fascinated. There's no question in my mind that 
any time he had been born into, he would have used the technology that was available to him. The point of the simplicity that Thor presents is not to let machines ride you, but you use the machines. Hi, Concord Public Library. This is Reverence. I think that uh, for sure, he, yeah. like many other people, would be not only fascinated, but uh, startled by uh, all of the information changes that we've experienced here uh, yeah, through the information technology. I think that they would find it like truly science fiction. And then there's the question of clutter. Simplify means clutter is out. But Walden clutter is definitely in these days, in Concord. Thoreau's become all the rage, and you see Thoreau quotations on T-shirts and sweatshirts and in advertising. I see you got the busts of Thoreau on the counter. Are they popular? Yeah, they come in, and uh, if you remember, you looked up the colors of the hair and the eyes. Ah, you probably uh, forget that. But... Which one Which one do people like best? Oh, the middle one, the middle age one. The middle one with the yeah, uh, some... Galway whiskers under yeah. his chin. This one is uh, was used for the basis of the postage stamp back oh, in really? the 1960s, uh. yeah. There are a lot of thorough people that objected to it. And I remember uh, one person here in Concord saying it was the only stamp she ever saw that you could spit on both sides. <laughs> <laughs> our ecosystem of puppets and these are our walking sticks these are cedar natural colored pencils and we also have a thorough throw t-shirts puppets walking sticks what would henry david say about all this beware of all enterprises that require new clothes well, he might count it a small thing, given the spirited defense of his pawn by these people. Of course, it's not his pawn anymore. It's something far grander, thanks to him. I think Walden Pond has become a symbol of the, the possibility of, this, of the single self. I almost wanted to say the purity of the single self, but I'm not sure I really like that word. But there, there is, he called it God's drop. And he used religious language for the pond. The pond meant something sacred to him. And it means something sacred to all those people who hike out there every year. I think uh, certainly the counterculture of the 60s um, picked up on uh, the spiritual and perhaps even mystical elements of, of Thoreau. Um, I can't say that I'm very much in touch with that today. Well, actually, that counterculture is alive and well today. And calling itself the new age. The Divine Unity Foundation is located in Missoula, Montana, of all places. Deborah West is its founder. Like Thoreau, Deborah and her group search for spiritual unity, though with a somewhat different approach. That cannot and will not be denied. What am I trying to do with Mother Earth here this morning and with the folks that are gathered here? There's quite a bit of talk about ascension and what does it mean? Does it mean shifting consciousness? Um, does it mean some kind of massive upheaval on this Earth? What does it really mean? Um, and I think that it's important to stay that it is a collective unfolding. The great brotherhood of light. The, the ecstatic experience of these people may be what Thoreau wrote about in Walden, or it may not be. I wonder what Henry would say about that. We can't know whether, witnessing these scenes, Thoreau would have applauded, laughed, or cried. We do know that there are other ways to search for spiritual unity. Much closer to Thoreau, at least more literal, is the Simplicity Movement in Seattle, Washington. Simplicity, simplicity. Simplicity says, let your affairs be as two or three, and keep your accounts on your I don't thumbnail. I not deal with it at all, but 
I bet you that you're, you guys are neat. We go pretty crazy if we have too much clutter, but I don't get rid of stuff very easily. These people have pulled out of the rat race and put aside the collecting of clutter. It's called voluntary simplicity and involves small groups or circles of people who meet in each other's homes to support each other as they try to simplify their lives. I'm surprised at how many people, when they say, you know, I ask, why are you interested in voluntary simplicity? Clutter is at the top of their list. And I think, wow. But somehow it frees your mind up when you get rid of all this stuff. So it's, it's, it's so, so strange to see how excited people get about this phrase, voluntary simplicity. Most of it is that people feel that they, they have no time, but it isn't just the lack of time. It's the fact that everything, they don't feel excited about life. They don't feel like, you know, this is it. And, and what they find is, is the more affluent a country is, the less community there is, the more labor-saving devices people have, the less time they have. And so it, it's, it's like th there's a certain ratio. You have to figure out just how much is enough, how much makes you happy. When you go beyond that, it takes over your life, and you're not really enjoying your life. For years, uh, my profession as a physician was very challenging, so I didn't really have much time or or energy uh, for anything except work. Um, by cutting back, uh, we're able to go for walks, uh, yeah. hour walks, several That's times right. a week, um, spending time with friends, uh, just digging in the garden. Well, they should, they should cut them back a little more. To me, the reason voluntary simplicity is so intellectually exciting is because it reflects so many themes. People's desire to live the authentic well, life, people's desire to have community, people's desire to have time for reflection. Um, so it brings everything. It means you examine everything you do. Oh, somebody did it. Hi. So voluntary simplicity is kind of this movement for connection, like it's connection with self, with others, with nature, and with a whole kind of a connection with a new kind of spirituality, a new kind of sense of of, of the universe, not a traditional religion, but a sense that, that there is a connectedness in the universe. And nature is part of that. And somehow, we've been cut off from that in the way we've approached our lives. A gray, overcast, still day and more small birds, tree sparrows, and chickadees than usual about the house. There have been a very few fine snowflakes falling for many hours, and now, by 2 p.m., a regular snowstorm has commenced. Fine flakes falling steadily and rapidly whitening all the landscape. In half an hour, the russet earth is painted white, even to the horizon. Do we know of any other so silent and sudden a change? The two winters Thoreau spent at Walden were long and hard. But winter seemed merely to offer him another reason to exalt nature and its eternal processes. Take long walks in stormy weather or through deep snows in the fields and woods if you would keep your spirits up. Deal with brute nature. Be cold and hungry and weary. Finally, the ice begins to crack and thaw. The signal spring has arrived. The promise of renewal. Thoreau describes it with a sentence that echoes accounts of the original Easter. Walden was dead and is alive again. It is glorious to behold this ribbon of water sparkling in the sun, the bare face of the pond full of glee and youth. It's Thoreau himself coming alive again with the spring, and hopefully by this time the reader too is finding new spiritual growth, new inspiration for his life as well from having read this book. In 1847, Thoreau left Walden and re-entered society. I left the woods for as good a reason as I went there.
Perhaps it seemed to me that I had several more lives to live and could not spare any more time for that one. It is remarkable how easily and insensibly we fall into a particular route and make a beaten track for ourselves. He had other lives to live and books to write. So he returned to Concord where he spent seven years writing and rewriting Walden. The book became not only about the Walden experience, but uh, came to be about uh, Thoreau's life and, and struggles and challenges uh, and victories uh, in the time between when he came back from Walden Pond uh, and when he finally published the book. That was 1854. He had already published Civil Disobedience in 1849 and lived long enough to see the issue of slavery ignite a civil war. In 1862, the year of the Emancipation Proclamation, Thoreau developed tuberculosis. He was dying, but his wit had not noticeably dimmed. When someone asked if he'd made his peace with God, he replied, we never quarreled. Thoreau was 44 when he died. The young author of Walton never did grow old. Well, Thoreau, uh, I think, was uh, very much at peace uh, when he died. Uh, I think that he was, um, he was ready to die. Henry David Thoreau's reputation and legacy have grown since his death to outshine and outweigh those of all the other transcendentalists, including Emerson. Millions of Americans enjoy that legacy today at our national parks. I think everybody traces the conservation movement back to Thoreau who, in a piece called Chisuncook, says, why can't we set aside some of our lands for national parks? He's the first one to actually put it in words. And it's Thoreau's disciple, John Muir, who is so effective in setting up the Sierra Club and founding the first of the parks out west. Thoreau had also been a pioneering ecologist with a strong sense of the interdependence of things in nature. He wrote a piece called The Succession of Forest Trees in which he makes an argument about why it is that oaks come in where there were pines before and pines come in where there were oaks before. And he explains it by how the squirrels have, have handled the seed. But he is interested in how, how the different things in the world relate together, and that's what ecology is. And he is one of the beginners of that. Thoreau saw the wonder in everyday things and he saw the work of God in the details of nature that he studied. I think one of the things that we've lost, and maybe the faster pace of life has the biggest contribution to this, is the ability to see that kind of wonder in mundane details. Instead, we want to believe in spaceships. <laughs> It might be that given our frenzied pace, our cell phones, our fast cars, our nearly total immersion in material things, that Henry David would refuse to have anything to do with the modern world. Or maybe not. The last thing Thoreau would have wanted to, to have been, I think, is limited to the 19th century. He would not, in my view, be wanting us to give 19th century answers to 20th century questions. Whatever Thoreau might think of the present day, his influences on it have been considerable. I think Walden is one of the greatest books to come out of the 19th century and maybe to come out of the American literary tradition uh, altogether. It's a book that gives you an idea about how to place yourself in nature in the way Thoreau placed himself in nature, which is, I think, 
an essential thing to be able to do, to plug into a kind of source of health that um, is available to anybody who's, who's living on the earth and has a place to study and pay attention to. The, the reaction when I first read Walden was that when he talked about the phrase, and not when I came to die, discovered that I had not lived, and I felt like, that's it. That's the measure of life. And that's the way I measure everything. Does it make me feel alive, or does it uh, make me feel dead? Walden Pond has left many legacies, but I think perhaps the most important is that it's become a part of the American imagination even for those who haven't read it. It has entered so deeply into the fabric of American life. You could say Walden or Walden Pond, and people who don't even know the book know that something has happened there. And they know that that something had to do with somebody going off, taking a little time out from life, taking a moratorium, finding himself or herself and then coming back into the world. And I think Walton Pond stands for that moment of crossing the threshold, the kind of rite of American passage. A lot has changed since Thoreau's time. He once gave thanks that men had not learned to fly and to spoil the air. Today, Walden Pond lies beneath the flight patterns of a nearby airport. Even the heavens are vulnerable now. For many, today's continual inroads on nature make Walden all the more relevant. For Thoreau believed, and many today believe with him, that individuality is found in unity, that civilization needs its wilderness, and that everyone needs some wildness. Mm -hmm. 